tonight we're going to talk about a bunch of different disciplines and how they bear on philosophy. And of course, these are coming from interviews that Tamler Summers did for his collection of interviews called A Very Bad Wizard, Morality Behind the Curtain. I love that book, and it's one that I recommend consistently to lots of people. The works by all of the philosophers in the interview, and, and non-philosophers, right? We're, we're especially talking about non-philosophers, actually. Um, the works by everyone that he interviews are very, very deep, and, and they could be, you know, talked about in an entire lecture all on their own. I just want to hit the highlights, though, um, especially as our semester is coming to a close. And I think that it's because non-philosophical work that nonetheless studies what a good life is or how to make right actions or how to understand what it means for us to live life or what we're doing whenever we're thinking about morality. Those things can lend, lend a fair amount of insight to these disciplines. That's what I'm going to try and convince you of today. and just. Like a fair warning, I'm not going to go into all the details, but hopefully this highlight will get you intrigued and you should totally pick out uh, or pick up Tamler's book because I think it's really fantastic. So the first person we're going to talk to tonight, um, talk about tonight is Franz De Waal. And he has lots of interviews, uh, TED Talks, all that kind of stuff. You could pop him into YouTube. And he has, you know, really great footage of some of his primate experiments, which I'll, I'll kind of talk about a little bit. And you can find this on YouTube, and it's, and it's really, like, much greater than just listening to me talk about him. But basically, he studies lots of primates, okay? And not all primates are the same. So humans are primates, right? And the hope is that by studying primates, maybe we can find out um, origins of our moral behavior by studying analogs in other primates. But the thing is, there's really divergent behavior. You have things like chimpanzees, which are very big and gruff apes. They're social and uh, they're very smart, but they also wage war on each other. They're, they're super violent. And then you have bonobos, which are kind of like the hippie ape. And they're completely matriarchal and their main regulation of, of basically solving disputes is genital to genital contact between the matriarchs. So war, genital to genital contact, right? Um, brute force, sort of hippie equality matriarchy. And the thing is, or the thing that he's trying to ask and other people are trying to ask whenever they're looking at primatology is, is there anything that we can learn about our morality whenever we study the primates? And Franz de Waal wants to say that there's a type of proto-morality or the beginnings or the building blocks of morality in primates and especially whenever you start to look at the emotions that other primates have so for example sympathy right the ways in which they understand um what humans or other apes are trying to do so there's experiments for example where like if i were leaning over the table and reaching for something and i couldn't get it but it, a chimp is in the room they notice that I'm reaching for it and they'll go and they'll pick up the object and they'll hand it to me, right? So there's something about primates that allows them to do that. Maybe this is the basis for something like sympathy. Or in one of the funnier clips, he sets up an experiment with two um, capuchin monkeys, which was what the first slide was. Little monkeys. And they've been trained. So they're in these like cages, right? Side by side, they can see each other, but they're separated. And they can see an experimenter who's in front of them. And so monkey A, they know that if, if the experimenter gives them a rock through their cage, they hand it back to the experimenter, and then they'll get a reward. Okay? But monkey A gets a slice of cucumber. Capuchins like cucumber. That's fine. They're okay with that. Um, monkey B, they hand monkey B a rock. Monkey B knows that it needs to hand it back, so it does it. The experimenter takes it, but instead of giving a cucumber, which is okay, they give it a grape, okay? And um, capuchins love grapes, and so that monkey is really pleased. So the other monkey sees the second monkey get the much better reward. So the experimenter hands the rock again to the monkey. The monkey's like, well, what gives? You know, I just got the, you know, the okay cucumber, but that, that monkey got a grape. 
and so it kind of like bangs the rock on the table to like test whether it's actually a rock. So you figure something out, hands it back to the experimenter. Experimenter gives him a cucumber. And then experimenter goes to monkey B, does the task, gives it another grape. And uh, at this point, monkey A will start to like shake the cage and even throw the cucumber at the experimenter if they haven't eaten it yet. Something like that shows that monkeys understand or, or primates understand fairness, right? There's a sense of reciprocity. We should be getting roughly the same as other people if we're doing the same as other people. And so when Franz Dwal looks at this, he thinks that morality isn't unique to humans, at least, you know, not radically, right? It's not like Kant in the sense that there's no other basis for it in in you know non-human animals rather the emotions show that there's the beginning of a development of morality now he will say that morality typically has an aspect of reason or impartiality at least some people are going to say that and he's going to say definitely you don't see that in 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 primates so it depends on what level of analysis you want and just like we've seen sentimentalist versus rationalist theories of morality if you have a strongly rationalist theory of morality like kant about universal reasons you aren't going to find that in non-human right but if you have something more sentimental like hume with the basis of sympathy or even emotions like jonathan Haidt with the pillars he's a humean right you are going to see those types of things into not in non-humans now, one thing that critics often say to Franz de Waal or other evolutionary biologists or people who try to talk about the biology of morality or the evolution of morality is they're going to say, look, uh, morality is, is really complex and it does really beautiful and profound things like me helping someone, right? Uh, even when it's against my own self-interest, like the love of a parent or altruism or whatever else. We don't see that, right? How could something like evolution, which is sort of a nasty process, animals killing each other, um, you know, animals leaving tons of offspring to hope that they leave survivors, the really, really nasty process of evolution, how can that produce something as beautiful as human morality? And here, Franz de Waal is very quick to talk about Beethoven's error. And Beethoven's error is roughly a, the idea that you shouldn't confuse the products for the process. Okay? The products are different than the process. Beethoven produced some of the most evocative and wonderful music that's ever existed. But he lived in squalor. Right. So if you went into Beethoven's apartment, you would see a disgusting apartment that smelled really awful. You would see a man that's really disheveled. Despite that, he produced really beautiful music. And so Franz de Waal is quick to say, look, uh, he, he's a primatologist, he's a biologist, he understands. The, the biology of morality is really messy and there's a lot of violence. But that nonetheless doesn't undermine what's going on in morality. Nasty processes in, in evolution can create beautiful and profound and intricate things. Okay? So, again, Franz Dwal, primatologist, and he's going to say that whenever you observe primates, one of the things that you see is that there is a type of proto morality in non human animals, and it makes sense that morality would have evolved. Okay. The second person that I'm going to talk about today is William Ian Miller, and he mostly studies honor cultures, especially through Icelandic sagas. So um, looking at more or less Viking tales um, about people and how they manage their reputations and things like that. And he's going to say, look, honor cultures, they kind of get sold short in academia. We tend to think of honor cultures as really brutish and simplistic. Cultures, right, where there's reputations. And these reputations, they, you know, 
they're regulated basically through violence. If someone slights you in an honor culture, it can be basis for you then to basically enact some sort of violence against them, right? And he gives a few examples in the interview. And for this reason, there's a lot of academics who don't want to pay any mind to the honor cultures, right? And he says, look, uh, there's a, a few things that we can say maybe to, to make this make more sense. The first thing is that honor cultures, they typically happen whenever there's scarce resources, okay? So you might think that the violence is very extreme, or you might think that um, this doesn't make any sense. But literally, if your family gets their sheep stolen or gets their grain stores stolen for the winter, your family might not survive. And this starts to make sense of why it might be important for you to be so harsh with certain slights or disrespects. You can't handle that in an environment where there's scarce resources, right? Alternatively, if you are someone who has abundance, you can handle slights because your life isn't on the line whenever your reputation is sort of affected by certain types of slights right? But he's going to say, despite that, despite the fact that violence might be used to regulate the ways that people interact, this isn't an individual thing. Honor cultures are group oriented, okay? If someone, for example, were to kill any of my siblings in an honor culture, before I went out and enacted revenge, I would need to consult my elders or consult my clan. Is it okay for me to go and avenge my siblings, right? And the reason that you need to do that is because if I were to just go rogue and someone were to like not see it justified as me enacting some type of revenge, my kin, my other siblings, my other cousins, they could be held accountable and killed as well. So there is social regulation in this sort of stuff. And throughout all of this, uh, Miller is going to say there's astute psychological insights in the ways that people are managing their reputation, okay? Because it's not the same for everyone. If you're a powerful person, again, you can kind of handle slights. And if you're a powerful person with lots of abundance, you need to make sure that other people don't resent you or hate you for that. It's, it's a careful reputation sort of management thing going on. And you don't just outright lash out against people. Maybe you imply something. So this is the story about the guy who shows the other guy his fist and he asks him, what do you think of this fist? And he says, it's very large. And he says, you know, well, how, do you think this could break bones? And he says, oh yes, easily. Something like that, right? And he says, then he says, get out of my chair. Right? So he doesn't punch the guy. He just implies, like, look, that's my rightful seat, and I have the means by which to enforce that that's my rightful seat. Get out of my way. Right? Now, maybe that's still brutish. Maybe you still don't like it. But Miller is especially trying to emphasize it's not as simplistic and it's not as, you know, arbitrary as sometimes it seems. And he makes a distinction between well and poorly functioning honor cultures. Properly functioning honor cultures have elders, right? Or they have some sort of wisdom or, uh, you know, experience-bearing group of people. And you don't just enact violence randomly. You do so with a purpose and within the rules. Because again, stuff can kind of go haywire if you don't do this. Poorly functioning honor cultures, so you could think of something like inner city gang violence. Um, there is honor at stake there. You do care about someone encroaching on your territory. You do want to exact some type of revenge for a slight. But there's often not consultation there. The violence is out of control. So Miller isn't saying that honor and revenge and the regulation of reputation are just unqualified goods. They're not right? But he's saying to pay attention to them because they tend to be really good bases for understanding how we act. 
Now, the thing is, um, we'd like to think that we're beyond honor cultures. And by we, I think uh, as an academic, right? But we aren't. And he's going to say honor still exists. One of the examples that he brings up is think about getting laughed at. There's no physical harm coming from that. Maybe not even really psychological harm. But there's a sense of honor in which, like, my reputation is being damaged in other people's eyes. If that didn't matter, why would I feel so weird about getting laughed at? Right? And so he's going to say, academics, you know, they're going to pretend that they, you know, they don't punch each other in most cases. They don't like have these motivations for revenge in most cases, at least like not explicitly, not physically. But he's going to say they're still motivated by honor. If you go to an academic conference, you'll see cliques, right? If you go to an academic conference, especially in philosophy, you'll see people outright insult each other and hate each other for things. So despite the fact that, you know, academics think that they're beyond honor or beyond these like regulations, they really aren't. And one insight that he's going to say about this is he's going to say, look, it makes sense that certain academics and, and he's in English uh, literature. So he's going to say, you know, literature scholars, philosophers, it makes sense that they're going to not like honor cultures because honor cultures aren't the ones who are sitting down and using reason to deliberate about abstract and impartial reasons. Right. That's what philosophers do. And if you ask a philosopher what morality is, big surprise whenever they tell you that it's all of the abstract, rational pontificating. So consider the person who's giving you the advice or giving you the characterization. And similarly, I think that would work with, you know, honor cultures. Consider that like a warrior would give you advice that war is the most valorous thing and it's the way that you regulate uh, certain types of behavior. Um, both summers and miller are really concerned that they might be valorizing honor cultures but on the other hand i think that there's something to their point even people who take themselves as civilized you know you, it's it's often not the case that we're beyond these honor measures watch something like mean girls right uh despite the fact that that film is really fantastic and i think it has feminist messages in it it still shows how brutal high school social interactions can be, right? Um, and I think the same sort of thing happens in academic or whatever interactions. And I think that's what Miller's trying to get us to see. Honor cultures aren't as simplistic as we've made them out to be. Moreover, we aren't as high-minded as we think we are. The next person that we're going to talk about is Kwame Anthony Appiah. And he's a really interesting intellectual. He himself is African, and uh, his family is from the Ashanti, and he has, you know, through, I, ooh, I'm not sure whether it's his father's or his mother's uh, line, he has social standing within the Ashanti. And then he went on to study at Cambridge, and he was at Princeton for a really long time, now he's at NYU, and he often draws on a lot of things that give him perspective, right? different cultures, uh, the effects of race. And I mean, because he himself is a man with dark skin, but he's been a man with dark skin within Ashanti people, in the halls of Cambridge, and in the halls of Princeton. These different contexts give him insight into these things, right? He's also uh, openly gay. This also contributes to different ways that he interacts with the world. And so in a lot of Appiah's work, he's considering things like race and gender and sexuality and all these aspects of identity and how they interact with what we think is right or wrong or what political, you know, notions of justice might mean. Okay, so I think what's important in this interview is that he's going to say look one of the things that philosophers need to do or just anyone who wants to understand moral and political interactions more accurately is they need to basically move from looking at how do we change the minds of individuals to how do we change the minds of groups or communities so moving from 
the atom to basically the molecule or the object trying to trying to add more social aspects into what's going on and part of this is because whenever you start to look at the social mechanisms the ways in which communities regulate behavior the ways in which multiple groups of people talk about what's going on you start to see that philosophy or abstract argumentation they might make things possible right you can't do something that nobody has any idea of how to do so you open up possibility whenever you talk about what might be the case in society but in order for minds to change you need more okay so if we want to end something for example like slavery right and and consider african chattel slavery so you know um taking people from africa and selling them to the americas right how do we change something like that it's not just a philosophical thing it's not something where you can just advance arguments there were lots of abolitionist arguments, I think even as early as the 1500s, okay? You have Franciscan friars writing about this. You have abolitionist groups within the Quaker communities in the Americas writing about this and preaching about this. Slavery didn't end for another few hundred years after these arguments existed. So knowing that, someone like Appiah is going to wonder, what, what is it that led to the change? Okay, and so what he's going to say is whenever you start to study these movements and he and he studies, uh, you know, the slave trade, he studies the case in China of foot binding. So this is the case where in, in certain circles within China, you would bind a woman's foot. So like a flat foot to basically bend in on itself because smaller feet were taken as more feminine and desirable. And it would kind of like keep them within the household. Right. How did that practice end? How did that practice end? What do you do whenever you look at these practices? And he's gonna say, look, morality is one of the mechanisms that we can use to control one another, All right? He's not denying that, it's really important. Again, you need to have the possibility or the thought to have occurred to someone in order to enact something like justice or being more ethical, right? But there's also other means, the laws, right and the punishments that might be inflicted on someone the economy so the ways in which we give economic reward or penalty to something or honor and dishonor the ways in which our reputation or our standing is harmed with one another be it within my own group right or within or or between groups and so he says look you look at something like chinese foot binding right and it wasn't necessarily morality that changed Chinese people's minds about this. So whenever the British were, were basically talking to the Chinese, like, hey, we don't, we don't like that, right? It wasn't morality that changed things. Law doesn't really matter here because it's an international affair and there's no basis for international law back then. Um, they didn't have to resort necessarily to trade embargoes or anything like that. But it was enough for them to say, hey, we're really uncomfortable with this idea. Like, it creeps us out. We don't like it. And, and we think less of you for doing this sort of thing. That's an aspect of honor, right? That's an aspect of honor. And that's something that's really interesting here. Appiah, despite the fact that he's an incredibly well-trained and respected philosopher, he doesn't think that morality, or the domain of philosophy, roughly, is the only way in which we regulate behavior. And historically, he doesn't think that that's, that's kind of what's led to social change, necessarily. Rather, it's just one mechanism. And it's just as important to consider law, to consider economy, and to consider reputation, right? And these things aren't necessarily going to be commensurable. They aren't necessarily all going to fall in line. And it might be the case that societies and social regulation is using all four. And there's conflicts, right? So it's not an easy picture. It's a really messy picture of social regulation. But through his historical examples, I think he makes a really plausible case for why we need to pay attention to all four mechanisms if we want to change behavior.
okay? So if you want to change behavior, sure, you can appeal to someone morally, but that's going to depend on them accepting those reasons that you're giving as moral and motivating them to do something. You could use law, you could use reward, economically, right? Or you could use honor. All these things are viable and cultures just kind of deal with all of these things. The other thing that he's really astute about observing is that identity can play a really big role in social change and regulation and motivation. So, for example, if you take something like the abolition of slavery, and he uses the, the abolition of slavery in Great Britain, he says, it wasn't enough that the moral arguments existed, right? Because those existed for a while and nothing was really happening. The law wasn't really doing anything, anything about it. But he says one of the things that was instrumental, um, you know, before the law kicked in, right, before economic stuff happened, was that people self-identified as abolitionists and they got together and they formed small groups and they petitioned, right, by forming groups and connecting people saying, part of who I am is that I am against this practice of chattel slavery of people from the African continent, right? That's part of who I am. So you get people's personalities and identities integrated into these moral stances, and that can lead to a better basis for organization. He talks about the example of farmers in Iowa. So there's really large factory farming in Iowa, and the citizens largely don't do anything about it. And he says, look, if they could figure out that they all as Iowans, whether Republican or Democrat, could fight against something like factory farming and the ways in which corporatization of corn or something like that is really harming them, they can identify as Iowans against that kind of thing and they can use that to mobilize against bad things that they could potentially change. So again, right, this isn't necessarily about morality. The morality is important. You want yourself to have, you want to have good reasons, but you also need to connect it to people and to organizations. And that's, and that's what's really, really important. That's what's really important. So that's what Appiah roughly talks about in his interview. The last couple of people that we're going to talk about is Alan Fisk and Tej Rai. And uh, they study basically social mechanisms of behavior. And what they eventually became popular for, because they wrote a book on this, is that is, it's the idea that everyone, almost everyone, psychopaths excluded, but they tend, to be, they tend to be the exception to a lot of things. Almost everyone is morally motivated. People do what they do because they think it's the right thing to do. So this is kind of an old platonic idea too. We do what we do because we think what we're doing is right. And that applies even to violence. So they use some really harsh examples. They use murder, they use suicide, they use domestic violence, they use child abuse, right? They study other cultures. Um, Fiji, for example, is one of the ones that's talked about in the, in the interview. And they say, look, even these people who are doing really bad things, like husbands uh, raping their wives, or like parents beating their children, or husbands beating their wives, they're going to say they don't think that what they're doing is wrong. Note, they are not saying that this is right. They aren't saying that this should be be the case. They're saying that whenever you ask them about what's going on, whenever you study these cultures, you notice that the reasons that they're doing these things are, for example, to instill virtue or because they feel like they need to, you know, uh, make sure that their reputation is good or they feel as though they are entitled to something like sex from a woman that they married. Those are moral reasons. They might be you know, espousing something immoral, we wouldn't say that they're correct, but it would be wrong for us to say that they're irrational, right? And I think that that's, 
the key to kind of what, what they're trying to say. It's perfectly okay for you not to be okay with any of the things that I just mentioned. But they would say it's really um, inaccurate if you think that people do bad things for bad reasons. And bad reasons in the sense that they think that what they're doing is wrong. No, if they do it, they think that what they're doing is right. Okay. And so this is Alan Fisk's theory. Tej Rai was his grad student and they worked together on a lot of stuff. But the basic idea is that morality regulates relationships. And there's four different ways of regulating relationships. Unity, where people are just kind of equal and doing something together. Authority, where there's a linear hierarchical command. People at the top are owed deference, right? People at the bottom um, don't have as much, you know, respect or, or authority, obviously, and they are basically to fall in line. You have equality matching. So people are equal in this, kind of like the unity case, but different from the unity case, people are paying attention to making sure that the equality is enforced. So if I am above my friends, say in economy, I sort of know how to pitch in to make sure that I'm more equal. Or if I owe something to someone, I know what I need to do in order to establish that amount of economy. So the unity is like, you actually are equal, you are actually doing the same sort of things, right? Equality matching is, is you want to be equal, but there may or may not be equality, and you're paying attention to it to try and regulate it and get it back to equality as much as possible. Market pricing isn't just economic in the sense of cash. This is more regulating relationships in the sense of saying like, this offense is worth this punishment, or doing this thing is worth this amount of clout, right? There's a way in which something is being used as a, as a, as a currency, but, as, but when I say currency, I don't mean money, where you're learning how to regulate lots of different relationships and behaviors by that particular currency, okay? And what they're going to say is that cultures are polymorphous. They might include all four of these regulations all at the same time, maybe even assessing the same exact thing. Okay, so again here, they're going to say, you know, it's it, maybe it's pessimistic, this view, in the sense that there's no one overarching view that can help you to figure out what exactly to do in a disagreement. But maybe by being honest to the ways in which morality is regulating relationships and the ways in which there's these four basic ways of doing so, maybe that gives you tools for making your case that maybe a market pricing way of making a relationship should actually be a unity way of making a relationship, right? And again, they're saying that morality isn't just about abstract, generalized, or universalized moral principles. The way of thinking about morality isn't about individual decisions. It's about group relationships, social regulation. Okay, so they're kind of trying to change the perspective and, and show how this might affect how we handle things. Because here's, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. If you think that, for example, something like domestic abuse is purely a cognitive uh, thing where the wrongdoers know that what they're doing is wrong, maybe you give someone a stern talking to or something like that, uh, but you don't do anything like you don't do anything to, to regulate what's actually going on. What you need to do is re-educate people to get them to realize that the reasons that they think are good actually aren't so good, or that the goods that they think that they're achieving and regulating that relationship actually are the wrong goods. That's not what they should be promoting, right? Maybe it shouldn't be sort of a uh, uh, market pricing thing in the context of a romantic relationship. Maybe that's not a good basis, right? Maybe it should be something like unity. Maybe romantic relationships shouldn't be authority-based. Maybe they should be something like, you know, unity, right? Or equality matching. So the, the idea here is that by taking seriously the idea that people who even do really bad things often think that they're doing the right thing from their perspective, you can start to diagnose the problem better and hopefully find more efficient and more effective solution. I think that's what they're trying to get at. 
So in all of this, we need to be really, really careful of what some philosophers call the naturalistic fallacy. And I think I've mentioned this before. Or someone who's just going to say, look, that's just how things are. And that's because we can make a two-tier distinction, right? The normative claims, which are about values, um, or, I'm sorry, this, this is, that's really, really bad. Uh, that should say ought. I don't know how, uh, it's a long semester, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, normative value ought. Normative value ought. Ignore that. Um, versus the descriptive, which is a fact or an is. So I got the is and the ought flip there. I'm really, really sorry. Um, that's a huge mistake on my part. Uh, that is, that is not right. So whenever you're thinking about norms, right, or, or, or let, let's go with the descriptive first. Whenever you're studying biology, like Franz de Waal, or whenever you're studying cultures like Tej Rai, or whenever, you know, you're looking at history, like uh, Kwame Anthony Ampia, you're looking at descriptive accounts. What actually happened? What are the facts? What is the case? And even though it might be the case that there is lots of domestic violence, or there is something like subjection of smaller populations that are vulnerable to larger, more powerful populations, that in no way justifies that that's okay. And that's because the justification, the idea that we have a value that says that this, this is right or wrong or just or unjust or fair or unfair, that's a normative claim. That's a claim about the way things should or ought to be. So there's a gap between facts and values or between is and ought, between the normative and the descriptive, okay? And we need to be really, really careful about using this descriptive work to talk about values. That said, I think that there are important insights, right? What can this teach us? And I think that, first of all, um, it's that we need to have a holistic picture of moral psychology. Um, we should not reduce morality simply to reason, okay? Now, maybe ultimately, you think that utilitarianism or Kantianism is right. And without a doubt, those are the most reason-heavy theories, okay? Um, that's fine. But when it comes to, like, how do we start to change people's minds, right? You can't just have that simple rationalistic view. You can't just change the reason of people. You need to educate their hearts. You need to change social structures and relationships. That's where the holistic psychological stuff comes, comes into play. Um, you can't just pay attention to one aspect. Similarly, you can't just pay attention to emotions. Emotions aren't everything, right? And emotions are really inconsistent. They often aren't a very good basis without some sort of rational regulation. This is because we feel very deeply for people that we're close to or similar to, right? That's not a very good basis. That would justify all sorts of really horrible things. So the rational or impersonal perspective helps us, right? It helps us. This is kind of the point that um, Jonathan Bennett is making in The Conscience of Huckleberry Finn. We really need to pay attention to all of the faculties that we have, and this is why we need to pay attention to multiple disciplines. Morality doesn't just focus at the individual level, but it also has social functions. It's about regulating behavior, okay? It's not just about abstract universalizing. So I'm showing my cards here um, a little bit, and certain philosophers are going to disagree. They're going to say, look, the basis of morality is precisely those arguments. It's precisely those theoretical questions. And as soon as you leave those, you aren't really doing ethics anymore. You're doing maybe applied ethics, or maybe you're doing something like moral psychology. You aren't doing philosophy anymore, or, or not, not the high-minded normative or meta-ethical stuff. Uh, I don't really care for that view um, because I think that the point of morality, and this is something that Aristotle echoes, and you'll see Aristotle in a lot of these conclusions that I'm saying, um, is, is we don't just care about justification. We care about actually changing things. We care about affecting behavior. And if we want to do that, we cannot ignore 
the effects of morality and politics on our relationships, right? That's especially what Fisk and Rye are talking about. That's especially what a lot of the people who are studying social psychology are kind of talking, pardon me, are talking about. And the last thing is basically morality bakes bread. So there's often a criticism that philosophy, it can't help us, say, solve engineering problems. It can't feed the hungry. But whenever you actually start to look at morality at this, as this wider scale enterprise, this multidisciplinary enterprise of studying human behavior and why we do what we do and why we think what we think and what a good life is according to us and how we regulate relationships with one another, we see that morality and philosophy actually ends up being incredibly practical. Again, an Aristotelian insight, but it's also something we saw in Dave Foster Wallace. If we get our notions of the good life wrong, we end up putting our lives at risk. If we pursue wealth, we'll feel like we never have enough and we'll be super greedy and we might be tempted to do things like Bernie Madoff or others, right? If we think that it's beauty, then, you know, maybe we'll get lots of cosmetic surgery, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? But maybe we can't afford that. Or maybe it's really risky. Or rather than doing cosmetic surgery because I want to be this particular type of person, it's actually like, you know, it's, it's more viciously motivated in the sense that I'm doing it only because other people are saying that this is what's beautiful. There's a huge difference between doing something because you want to do it and doing, doing something because it's kind of what's, what's fashionable and what you think you have to do, right? What morality allows us to do then is to understand why we're doing what we're doing, okay? And it gives us tools to assess whether we think that's right or wrong, good or bad. Are the values that we're living by actually going to lead us to live a better life? Is the way that I'm assessing this action, be it from a consequences standpoint, be it from a motivation standpoint, or its effects on my character and my flourishing, is my perspective affecting what my ultimate verdict is and does it change whenever I study things from multiple perspectives? And so what I'm trying to say here is that morality isn't just abstract, right? It is something that is very intimately tied to things that matter to us. And I hope, I hope that you've seen that sort of stuff throughout the semester. So I'm going to leave this as a, you know, relatively short lecture compared to the other ones, because I think that this is the core idea. And I just want to thank you again for doing so much reading and, and sticking with me and trusting me with your time and letting me talk to you about some really tough stuff. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I will see you next time. As always, I'm available via email or in office hours. We can set up some time to meet. So I'll see you all next time.